You guys have no idea how cool it is <laughs> to be standing here right now. Uh, the last couple months have been filled with uh, beans and ugali. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been sitting and just basking in, in the amount of food that I've been able to eat and will eat this next week. So uh, it's awesome. But uh, thank you for having me, Dad. Uh, Pastor, thank you. Um, you know what's funny is that actually the last couple weeks I've felt like God was putting a message inside of my spirit uh, for this church. And I was thinking, you know, it's probably maybe something that I'm going to preach when I'm when I'm back in December. Uh, but like how forward and kind of rude is it to ask, Dad, can I preach? You know, like or but uh, he, he just opened it right up. He was like, Dustin, do you want to preach this weekend when you come? And I was like, boom, this is what this is for. Right. So I want to uh, share a little picture with you guys. Uh, it's not going to be on the screen. It's a it's a picture that I want you to think about. Um, oh, well, my title is up. I shouldn't have pressed that button yet. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you guys about two different lakes. OK, you're like lakes. OK, I want to tell you about two different bodies of water that you can find in the world. And I want to give you a little bit of picture about them. And I want to just cause you to think a little bit, okay? So the first lake that I want to tell you about is the Dead Sea. H how many of you have heard about the Dead Sea? Uh, and it is the most salty lake in the whole world. You can float on top of the water, right? Uh, it's so much salt that you can't even drink three liters of it without dying. Like, you, you, you can't even drink one liter without being very poisoned in your in your, in your system. It's so salty. There's no life. There's no fish. There's no ve uh, vegetation around. There's no plants. There's nothing around. It's just a very dead area, okay? Uh, and then there's another lake that I want to tell you about. Uh, it's called the uh, Sea of Galilee. How many of you have heard of this, this uh, lake? And uh, it's kind of the opposite of the Dead Sea. It's super uh, vibrant with life, and there's lots of fish, there's lots of uh, trees, vegetation. It's so beautiful. Uh, it, it, it couldn't be, like, you, you could visit. The, it's like a tourist destination, right? Um, so what is the difference between these two lakes? It's the same water that flows into them, right? There's water in both of them, but why are they different from each other? One has an outlet. Can you tell me which lake has the outlet? the Sea of Galilee. So the picture that I want to show you here is that if you don't have an outlet, you're going to die. And uh, that's why I wanted to share, Dad, something happened. I think it's this. Let's see. Can you put up that, uh, there you go. There's my title. <coughs> this is not going well. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come. Maybe we should pray right now. So, So, Father, we come before you. I thank you so much. Uh, I ask, Lord, that you would just speak. It wouldn't be me speaking, that it would be you speaking. Lord, I, I, I don't want to be in the way. Get me out of the way, Lord, and uh, just help me, Lord, as, as uh, I, I uh, teach your word. I ask that you would come and be with us here today, Lord. That's a promise uh, in your word, and I just ask uh, that you would just show up, Lord, and you would, uh, you would work through the failings of the preacher, Lord, and that you would uh, work through somebody who's not perfect, Lord, but your son is perfect. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Holy Spirit, come and uh, speak to us today in Jesus' name. So, yeah, there's my title. It's Evangelize or Die, okay? Super, super serious title, but I promise it's just to grab your attention. So, today, w wasn't that a pretty useful picture, the, the two lakes, the the, the the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and the Dead Sea has no water flowing out of it, okay? So everything that gets poured into it, it just builds up in salt content, and then everything dies. And I just think that's a beautiful picture about if we don't have an outlet to our faith in Christianity, then spiritually we die. We, we become weird. We we start to think about weird ideas, and then we bear no fruit, okay? So I want to take you to a, uh, a, a passage of scripture in Mark. Uh, 
chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Daniel would be in uh, verse, starting in verse 2. Okay, so I want to read uh, this passage, and then we'll just pray for the word just quickly. So, uh, and it says in verse 2, it says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning, what does this rising from the dead mean? And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So, Lord, we just pray, Lord, as we open your word, that you would just show us uh, what you're trying to say to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, we read a little story here uh, where Jesus takes the disciples up away into the mountain, and he shows them something really crazy. Can you imagine being in that situation? Like, you're, you're taken by Jesus up into the mountain, and he, before you, just changes into his glory. And his, lin his, his linens and robes are whiter than any white you could ever make, anybody could ever make. And he just shows you his glory. Wouldn't you be kind of afraid, like it says that Peter was? Wouldn't, wouldn't you just be like, oh, my gosh, what just happened? And today, I want to take you through uh, the perspective, because uh, we read these stories and we focus on Jesus, as we should, but I want to show you kind of the perspective that the disciples have in, in both of the stories that we're going to read today. So, of course, uh, Peter is afraid. He's like, what is, what is going on? Jesus just showed me his glory, and he starts kind of spouting off like, Lord, it's good that we're here, and I can imagine he's kind of like, Ugh. Like, maybe we can make a tent for Moses and Elijah and you, and we can all just stay here. So isn't that kind of like what we do, you know, in church? We, we, we build a ministry, and we, we all come away. And when you build a ministry that is just surrounded on only being on the pr in the presence of the Lord, you start to get kind of weird ideas, right? It, everything is just based around hey, everything we do, we just lift up the Lord, and, and we let's just stay here. And you lose focus on the whole point of why Jesus is drawing you away in the first place. So it's good that we go away with Jesus to the mountaintop, but it's good that we recognize why we go with him to the mountaintop. And I want to show you exactly why we go. So uh, what I'm not trying to do is tell you that it's bad to be in the presence of the Lord or to want to be in his presence, but to recognize why we get into the presence of God, okay? So he takes them up to this mountain, he shows them the, his glory, and they are just in awe with him, and Peter starts spouting off, it's good that we're here, let's make tents, okay? Let's stay here. And basically, as he's talking, God interrupts him, okay? It says, it says, and sudden, wait, it says, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Basically, God's saying, like, Peter, stop talking. Just listen to my son, okay? And it's funny how immediately when Peter just stopped and just listened, and it says, and suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. 
Isn't it funny that when we, when we focus on Jesus, everything else just clears up. It goes away. And I want to talk about this idea of like when we don't have an outlet, when we get out uh, of what we're supposed to be doing and when we forget uh, what the mountaintop is for and we, it's, we start to form these weird ideas. You know what I'm saying? This is, uh, did you know that almost every single heretical idea that has come out of the church has come out of people just sitting around and talking? Did you know that the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they formed uh, heretical ideologies <laughs> because they just sat around and talked about the meanings of Greek words and about, and I'm not saying it's bad to talk about the meaning of a Greek word, but there's a point where when we don't have an outlet, when we're so focused on just talking about things, we start to get these weird ideas. And I want to tell you that to today that it's really important to just silence everything and just listen to Jesus. Focus on Jesus, okay? Focus on Jesus. When you are busy just focusing on Jesus, it has a, w a way of clearing out weird doctrines from the church. When you are focused on doing what the Lord has called you to, you don't have time to sit around and just talk about weird stuff. It clears weirdness out of the church, and then suddenly you have a, a biblical, healthy church that's doing what it's supposed to do. So, moving on, it says, so they kept the matter to themselves. Oh, wait, wait, I'm in the wrong scripture. This is my son, uh, beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So, Jesus shows them his glory. They freak out. God corrects them. And then immediately they leave from the place. And notice how the tendency of Peter was like, let's stay here forever. Let's, let's build a church here. And let's just pray. And let's just be in your presence forever. But God was like, no, that's not what I want. I want you to listen to my son. And immediately Jesus takes them and he leads them down into the valley where later you find out what he did next was that he healed uh, the, the demon-possessed boy. So immediately he's on mission to go and do something in the valley. And so listen to Jesus. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus, you got to follow him where he goes, not try to keep him inside of your church. So le let me tell you something. Many people build ministries out of the presence of God, okay? This is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing to want Jesus' presence. But they build ministries that are just centered around presence. And you notice that usually those ministries are the ones that are teaching weird things, and they're doing weird things. They're waving flags and blowing shofars and handling snakes, you know. But they're not doing anything to preach the gospel and move it forward. Uh, but let me tell you something, that if you want to stay in the presence of Jesus, it's a really good thing. But after some point, he's going to be so moved out of compassion that he leaves. And he goes down into the valley because he wants to reach people who are lost. And so when we're following Jesus, we have to recognize that there's more than just being in his presence that he wants us to do. We have to want his presence, listen to him, and follow him where he goes. And when you follow Jesus, he's going to lead you out onto the street. He's going to lead you out to the street corner to share with a person who needs to hear about him. So get focused on the presence of God so that you can hear his instructions for you to leave and go and preach. You know what I'm saying? Are you with me? Lord, I just pray right now that you would just break through. I bind every spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus. I ask that you would help me, Lord, in Jesus' name, to get across what you, what you are speaking this morning in the name of Jesus. Mm. <laughs> so, it says, and they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? 
And he said to them, uh, oh, wait, no, let me go back. It says, as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. You know what's funny about that? I love this part because this kind of just, this, this, this gets me. I'm like, why, why should we not, t- why would I not tell anybody about what I just saw? Lord, you just showed me your glory. You just, you, Moses came and Elijah came and, and you're telling me not to tell anybody about it? Like, why should I not tell any about it, anybody about it? And I think that Jesus didn't want them to tell anybody about it because he didn't want them muddying up the gospel. He didn't want them to just tell people about Moses and Elijah like they would have done and go and have little, uh, you know, theological conferences where they just talk about Moses and Elijah. He wanted them to, uh, to tell them about th- his resurrection first. He said, don't tell anybody until I rise from the dead. What I get out of this is let's not tell people about Moses and Elijah before we tell them about Jesus' resurrection. Let's not get anything in the way until we preach the simple gospel. Let's not let our, like, theologies and ideas be the first thing we talk about. Let us talk about Jesus dying and resurrecting first before, because then if we talk about all that other stuff, we're going to muddy up the gospel, and that's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to go and preach the simple gospel about him. Hmm. Yeah. And I know there's a lot more depth to this, okay? But I, but I, but I think that what's really important that we get out of this is that Jesus— when we, when we get around in circles and we just talk about things and there's maybe unbelievers who are around and they're asking us questions about this and maybe, maybe I should stop and be like, hey, but first can I tell you about Jesus? He's the one we center our faith on, right? Hmm. And then they said, Elijah came uh, first to restore all things and how is it written that the Son of Man should suffer any, uh, many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elisha has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. And so I just want to say, guys, that, that when, we, when we just let the, the word come into us, just like the, 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 the Dead Sea, there's water going into it, but when we don't have anything coming out of us, that's when things happen. That's when that's when the weird ideas start to happen in the church is because people aren't then turning around and telling people about Jesus. If you want a healthy church, begin to preach the gospel. If you want a healthy life, begin to preach the gospel. If you want weird doctrines to to be cleared up out of your church, preach the gospel. If you want to live a Christian, simple Christian life and follow Jesus, begin to preach the gospel. That's what that's what Christianity is, is evangelism. Evangelism is Christianity. Let me tell you, if if we're not excited to to, to be the hands of feet, I was talking about this with my mom this morning. If we're not if it doesn't excite us that we are the hands of feet and that we have uh, of Jesus and we have an opportunity to share about him today and and he can he can do his works through me and I can lay my hands on the sick and see them get well if that doesn't excite me there's something going on there's something wrong because it must mean that I have all this water pouring into me but I'm not pouring anything out in in into my community right are you guys with me <laughs> amen I, I, I want to be I want to be somebody who's not so salty. I just heard I stole that from you. I want to be somebody who's not so salty. I want I want to I want to let the word word of God flow out of me. You know, just as much as I receive it, you know, I I, I want I want it to come out too because I I, I think I, I just want to camp here for a second because I think there's this idea in the church that church is for me that I come to worship to fill myself up mm-hmm. have you ever like heard the excuses that people have because the, the the reasons they give for leaving churches I wasn't getting filled up there oh 
well, maybe it's because God doesn't trust you to go and then pour out into other people. You know, like I wasn't get, it, it, it becomes all about what I can get out of the church instead of being filled up so that I can go fill others. Right. Jesus is a constant flow of living water. There's no end to the, the resource of water that he gives. And if I just want him to pour and pour and pour into me, at some point, I'm just going to be capped up. And then there's just going to be so much salt pouring into my system, and then I just become weird. You know? I just become weird. And I'm, ta I'm talking from experience, guys. I, before I left for, for, for Kenya, there was a, there was a solid couple months where I, I wasn't sharing Jesus with anybody. I was just like, like just taken in, just taken in. Be thought I was was becoming more spiritual and you know like just weird stuff. And I think the most natural thing to do with our faith is to have an outlet and pour, to pour into other people. Hmm. Let me pull out my notes. There was more I wanted to say. So, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, Peter, when he went up onto the mountain for Jesus to then show him his glory, that's what we want in this church, right? We, wanna, we want this place to be the mountaintop. We want this place to be the mountaintop. But what's the purpose of the mountaintop? For then to get filled up so that we can go down into the valley, okay? So, so let me tell you something, that ministry, what we do here at Real Life Church, ministry— is like walking, okay? Uh, doing ministry is like walking somewhere. To walk, you have to have two feet, right? Two legs. Can I tell you what the two feet of, of ministry is? Is prayer and evangelism. If you try to go anywhere without one of those two things, as a minister of the gospel, you're not going to get anywhere. Because if you're not praying for your evangelism, you're not going anywhere, right? You're, if, if I'm not prayed up before I hit the streets, before I go out and share Jesus with people, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to be effective. But if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm only ever praying, if I'm only ever taking in, then I'm also limping. I'm also hopping around, you know, because I don't, I don't have that other leg to support me in, right? Hmm. So then the other story that I want to go with you guys is to Mark 6. I realized I haven't been putting the scriptures on the, on the screen either, Dad. You've got <laughs> a bunch of text here going on. So uh, chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. This is uh, the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Hmm. And this is where I want to I want to focus on the disciples in this passage is, uh, you know, again, we a lot of times we read these stories and we read about the miracle that Jesus does. And we're just so enamored with him as we should be. Well, I want to focus on 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 the disciples here on their side a little bit. OK, so let's read. It says the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to a boat, in the boat, to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into their surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. <coughs> but he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. When he had commanded them, uh, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. 
So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the loaves, the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all, uh, and, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets of, of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So here we see the disciples. Um, again, Jesus is at the very beginning of this story. He's calling the disciples away again. Okay, He's calling them to go to a desolate place to be with him, to be in his presence, to rest, to, to be filled up. And uh, uh, this time it looks a little bit different. This time they, uh, they don't actually get to go to that place with Jesus. They try to go, and then all the people rush in on them, and they, they, they get kind of surprised. And uh, the, the, the crowds, you know, just kind of took over. And so Jesus, obviously being Jesus, takes that opportunity, even though they needed rest, he takes that opportunity to minister to them anyway because he had compassion on them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. It says, and when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. The hour is now late. Send them away. Get them away from here. Get the, like, I, I don't, uh. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. After even more giving, they, they had been ministering all day. They didn't even have an opportunity to eat. After even more giving, they wanted j the, to, to, to send the crowds away. So they tell Jesus to send them away so they can go and buy their own food. Did you notice that? So they can go and, and buy their own food. And Je Jesus says clearly, you feed them. You give something to eat. Like, but, but Jesus... How do, you, how do you expect these guys, they, they've been working all day. Isn't it right that they have a time to rest? Isn't it right that, like, you send these people away? Isn't it right? Uh, you know, how can you expect them to feed all these people out of their pockets? How can you expect them to do something that they don't have the resources for? Jesus, maybe, maybe they should just go to the, the church over there. That, you know, that does that kind of thing, that evangelism thing. We, we don't really do that here. We just, we just pray here. We just want to be in your presence, Lord. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you send them over to that church over there? That, uh. but, um, but this is what Jesus says. He says, you feed them. So what he's saying is every person has a responsibility to feed them, okay? Every single person has a, a responsibility to feed the people who are, who are lost and who need Jesus. So they immediately question Jesus, and they see, uh, it, immediately their mind goes to what it would cost. Did you notice that? They immediately their mind goes to what it would cost to feed these people. They didn't say, oh, we don't have the bread or fish to do that. They immediately went, Jesus, you know how much that would cost? Are you expecting that to come out of my pockets? Do I, that's that, like there's another passage that it says that that's like a year's worth of wage. That's two years worth of wage. I don't, I, I can't do that. But you notice that Jesus didn't ask them to take anything out of their possessions. He didn't, he, he said, you feed them. So Jesus brings it back to what he commanded them. He didn't ask them to take out of what they didn't have but what, out of what they did have, and that's where I want to go next, is he said, how many loaves do you have? So what I want to show you is that Jesus doesn't ask you to then feed the lost, to go reach out to people out of what you don't have. Jesus asks you to do it out of what you already have. He says, how many loaves and fishes do you have? And I think I, I want to camp here because a lot of the pressure that people feel surrounding um, evangelism and why they make excuses as to why they're not called to do it or they don't feel like is because a lot of people base whether or not they should share Jesus based on what they have, based on 
oh, do we have enough fish for this? Or do I have the time? Do I have the money? Do I have the res- do I have the energy? They base it on what they, uh, th- what they, what they don't have. Instead of looking at what Jesus has given them, is a commandment to go and preach the gospel. So Jesus is not asking you to go and start a big ministry uh, where where you can reach out to hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, unless he is doing that, I think that a lot of people feel the pressure that when they are called to be an evangelist, as you are, they feel that they have to be at that level instead of recognizing that God is just calling you to win one person. God is just calling you to, to, to evangelize where you are. Th- there's no pressure to, to go and do something big that somebody else is called to do for you to pull the money out of your own pocket. He never called you to take out of what you don't have. He's calling you to use what you have to preach the gospel. Hmm. All they had was a measly five loaves and two fish. You, you, you think about that for a second? They didn't have anything. Like not even, th- there was 12 disciples. Five loaves and two fish is not even going to feed 12 disciples, <laughs> let alone 20,000 people. This passage about, is about Jesus feeding the 5,000. The scholars believe that it, 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 was, it was probably more like 20 to even 25,000 people because they weren't uh, marking down the women and the children in these counts. So you, uh, you think about how crazy it was that Jesus was saying, take out what you have, and we're going to feed all these people. Can you just, uh, like, think about if Jesus did that to you. Dustin, take out the, the, the five, lo- five loaves and two fish that you have. We're going to feed these 20,000 people. Imagine what your mind would be going to. Lord, how can I break this bread into, like, all these little pieces? Can I, can I, can I do it? Lord, I, I haven't eaten all day. You want me to give away my carne asada? I, I can't do that. Lord. <laughs> Jesus was asking them to give away what was intended for them to feed themselves. And this is where I want to tie it back. Ministry feeds us. When we come here, we worship and we pray what was intended to come into us, Jesus then asks and says, hey, I want you to give that away. And what he's going to do is he's going to use that to feed a whole lot more people than you think you can feed with what he gives you. That's, that's the beautiful part of this. It takes a paradigm shift in your mind to understand this, uh, that, that what you thought was to build you up what you thought you came to real life church to get here today, God is putting in your pockets so that you can go and feed the people of Imperial Beach. Right? And to feed you. Because I want to show you next that he actually multiplies the fish so much that there was leftovers and it fed all 20,000 people and nobody went hungry. Not even the disciples. They took away the leftovers and probably went away and like, because they're so, you know, So then Jesus, after asking them, hey, how many fish do you have? How many, how many loaves do you have? He then gets to work. He hasn't told them his plan yet. He's like, okay, that, that's good enough. We'll work with it. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, like they're like, Jesus, th- we don't have enough. We don't have enough for all these people. Can you, uh, and then this is really what I want to hone in here, is, is what then Jesus asks them to do. So this is a really cool picture, and I actually got this from my, my uh, teacher in Kenya, is, is focusing on the disciples in this, pic- in, in this moment, is that Jesus, he asks them, okay, loaves and fish, they present it to Jesus, like, Jesus, y- you got to do something, because I can't take these loaves and fish and feed all these people. You got to do something. And they're like, I just want to be close to you, Jesus, because y- y- you can do I can't do it like, you know. And so he what he takes the bread, he prays for it, he blesses it. And then what does he do next? He turns around and gives it back to the disciples. And goes, divide it. Divide it. 
So he, he puts the loaves and fishes into their baskets and commands them to go around all the groups and divide the loaves and fish to the, all, all the people. And can you just think for a second? This is, this is where I want us to get our minds. Is I have a basket with like one loaf, <laughs> however Jesus divided. I don't think that it divided or multiplied as he prayed for it. They have one loaf and like a third of a fish between all the disciples <laughs> in each basket. And they reach in and, and, and they're like, okay, here you go. Uh, and then they're, they're, they're like a little bit less now. And then to the next person, and they're like, it's getting short. They're not looking in. Oh, he said to feed all the people. How am I going to make this work? And it takes faith to reach in and to grab something that's not there, that you know after I get, that's probably all that I have left now. Uh, it's not there anymore. It takes faith to reach back down in and grab something that shouldn't be there unless a miracle happens. And this is what I want to tell you is that when you are doing ministry, when you are doing evangelism, it takes faith to then reach back into the basket where there shouldn't be anything, where there shouldn't be anything left. There's not even enough for you. You will have to reach back in and break so that you can reach out to the next person. Let me tell you, evangelism gets hard, okay? And, and, and there, there has to be like a, a, a mental, there's a mental block between uh, us and talking to people. And it, it's really hard. And just like the bread breaks, I break every single time I talk to somebody. But in faith, I reach back in. I grab Jesus. I don't have enough. You're taking what little that I have in myself, uh, and, and you are the one dividing it to all these people. I don't have it in me. But the point is, is that Jesus was the one giving them the, the, the resources to, 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 to break it and to, to give it to the people. And so what I want to tell you today is that you don't have enough, but it's Jesus through you that will reach out to the people. Hmm. Hmm. It says he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces in the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. In the end, Jesus was the one that divided the loaves and the fish among the people. Even though the people, uh, the, the disciples were the ones that did the work of passing out the loaves and fish to the people. Jesus, it gives Jesus the credit for dividing the loaves and fish among the people. So that gives me a little bit of hope. I don't have to trust in my own power. I don't have to trust in what I want, you know, or what resources that I have. Jesus is just asking me to give what I have, and he's going to multiply it. He's the one that gets the credit. He's the one that's going to get all of the glory, okay? Hmm. I love this. this. This passage just shows me how much that we can do if we were to get a hold of this truth. This, this little church. I actually looked up what the population of Im Im Imperial Beach was. You know how much it is? It's, it's like twenty six to 27,000 people in Imperial Beach. How many people did 12 people feed? Like 20 to 25,000. How many people are here? Like, like way more than 12. How many? 30? 30 of us. Imagine if 30 of us. There's no reason that all of Imperial Beach couldn't be saved and get fed through what we're doing here. If we would realize that what we're doing is, is, is we're, we're getting filled up here and then we're going out there. And we're preaching the gospel and we're, 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 we're giving out of what Jesus is, is doing and multiplying, right? The beautiful part of the gospel is that it's multiplied. It's not added. So you, when you reach one person, that person, if you're making a disciple, making disciple, that person is going and then reaching out to people. The, the gospel could explode in this area. You know what I'm saying? 
If we, if we were just to, to look in and realize, you know what, Jesus, I'm not comfortable. I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm not comfortable with talking to people. But I'm going to be faithful with what you've given me. I'm going to obey with what you've given me. And, and, and God has given you a job and coworkers to be with. He's given you friends and unbelieving family. Imagine what Jesus could do through you if you were to take what's, being fi- what's filling you up at this church and to divide it among your friends and your family and your coworkers and, and, and the people who are out there who need the gospel. So, I mean, that, that's pretty much it, guys. I, I know it was a little bit of a short message, but I really felt like, like this is, a, and, and I hope you understand my heart in this. My heart is not to sit here and correct the church that I think is not evangelizing. You guys are. You guys are doing all of the work. My goal in this message is actually to lift you guys up, to, to, to remind you guys that you do have what it takes. You can go out there and preach the gospel. You can be a, a, a group of people who is capable of reaching a whole community if you just recognize what this is for. So... With that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close. Let me just pray. So, Lord, thank you so much uh, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for uh, using me, even though I'm, uh, you know, not, not perfect or I'm not anything special, Lord. I thank you so much that, that you've called me. And I just ask right now that you would just, you would show up, you would show your love right now, and that you would just be uh, here, that you would just minister to our hearts, Lord. Show us where we can grow in this area. Show us what my five uh, what my five loaves and two fish are, Lord. Maybe I don't know what my five loaves and two fish are, but show me, Lord, so that I can divide it. Lord, I know you're not asking me to feed 20,000 people. You're just asking me to present to you what I have. And so I ask right now that you would show each and every one of us here who are in this room today what our five loaves and two fish are, where our sphere of influence is. You've called each of us to reach one. Lord, show us that if we were to reach one, that, that, that the whole world could change. The whole world would be different, Lord, if we could just step outside of our comfort zone and to break that bread one more time, Lord, and in faith and, and to grab what's not there, Lord, because you are, the, you are a miracle-working God. And you divide things supernaturally through your grace, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Don't go anywhere. So, how many of you know that, um, so Dustin is a missionary. He spends, he's full-time. He's in school, and they are... They're reaching the continent of Africa. And um, the Bible says that we receive gifts through laying on of hands. Paul told Timothy, fan the gift of the flame, you know, fan the flame of the gift that was laid on you when, when we laid hands on you. You know, you've got, to, you've got to put this into practice. If you don't have an outlet right now, I would like Dustin and maybe Luna and, uh, you know, and, and Dennis and... And myself, I spent years as a street evangelist behind a microphone, behind a bullhorn. We want to pray for you so that you'll have an outlet. I have an outlet. I'm making disciples, Bible college, all this other stuff. That anointing can go on you too. But if you don't have an outlet, say you're more of the shy type and you're like, you don't have, uh, you know, unsaved friends. You don't have people that you're working on. You don't have, you know, uh, a, an outlet. You're like the Dead Sea. We want to pray for you and and give you some boldness and courage to to take a step, to, to take a simple step. And this is going to require you to have faith, like he said, to reach into what you don't think you have and to start to to speak for his behalf. Because people are scattered and without a shepherd and they don't know the gospel and they're going to perish unless you go to them. They're going to perish unless you wake up and are fully seeing what God is doing in and through your life. 
You know that many times pastors plead with their people, invite somebody to church. And the reason that they don't invite somebody to church is because everybody that they know is in this circle of people and they are all saved. And like, well, I don't know anybody that's out there. Well, if, if you don't know anybody that's not saved, you don't have somebody coming over to your house to share food with you, then you're becoming like a dead sea. And so we want to pray for you right now. And then when we're done with that, I want to have you stick around for just a second. And, and I want to do like Lenny just reminded me. We want to ask you some questions. What are you seeing in Africa? And, and because we're, we're seeing it, we're going to be seeing it here. There's opportunities here for you to do what they're doing there. There's opportunities for you here. Believe me, there are. We go out a lot and frequently, and there's some things coming up that you're going to want to be a part of. But listen, I'd like us all to stand. And if you are becoming a Dead Sea Christian in any way, you aren't sharing like you believe you should be sharing, I'd like you to take a step and to come up along the side aisles, to come up here, we'll make space, we'll, we'll get some stuff out of the way or whatever we got to do. But I'd like to have you come up and we're going we're gonna to lay hands on you and believe that God will begin to use your life. Look at this. This is beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. So in Jesus' name.
All right. Hey, we are going to um, just have a seat for just one more second. I just want I want to sh have Dustin share some of the things that he's experienced in in Kenya. And so, how many how many um, festivals did you guys um, participate and put on this year? So I participated in three festivals, but SOS Adventure did four. Uh, I just wasn't able to be part of the first one, but we went to um, Kigoma, Tanzania. Uh, Tanga, Tanzania, and Kibaha, Tanzania. All of them were in Tanzania this year. And uh, we just saw some crazy things. But my dad was sharing some figures earlier that we preached the gospel to, I think, almost 800,000 people this year. Uh, there's something about seeing the amount of people that come uh, to these festivals and, and want to wanna like hear about Jesus. It's crazy. I, I, I was able to work with the tech team up on the stage and watching – um, just as, as thousands and thousands of people would come every night, like, like tens of thousands of people. O over this year, how many people got saved? Um, 120,000 salvations this wow. year. So, no, no, usually that stuff is like kind of uncountable because, um, we don't, we don't ask people to raise their hands. They actually have technology now where they'll fly over with a drone and count all the hands that are raised for salvation. Um, so that's how we're getting those numbers. Uh, but for healing, there's really no way of quantifying but the, the healing. But the tents, they're like demon-possessed people, they're filled, right? And they're filled every single night, every yeah. Single night. People are getting free, right? Especially in s something, yeah. something big, yeah, something big like that. Okay, so, so um, you were supposed, you did... The SOS did four, and they were supposed to be six uh, this year, or they're shooting for six. Uh, they were sh they're shooting. That well, there's eight, eight scheduled, scheduled next year. Okay, so yeah, so, so so there's eight scheduled. So you you can extrapolate that number and see that over a million people are going to hear the gospel, right? Yeah. Well, especially in some of the cities that we're going to, we're doing I think three in Kenya uh, next year, and they're like the biggest cities. So. It's called the 1040 window. 1040, can you explain what that means? So the 1040 window is uh, longitude 10 and longitude 40. And between these two lines of longitude, there is uh, 95 or something like that, 95 to 99 percent of the world's unreached people groups. Um, so it's a, it's a group of people that is – uh, almost never heard the gospel before. There's less than, I think it's 0.1% of evangelical Christians. Uh, so they have no way of uh, statistically of reaching their their people group in any impactful way. So, so are you guys just going in and preaching the gospel and then leaving? No. So what we do, <laughs> loaded question. So <laughs> what we're doing is that we uh, are going in. We actually have a team of people that goes to each location uh, way beforehand, up to nine months before the festival happens. And they gather together all of the, the elders of the church that is there, uh, and they get them all ready uh, and train them uh, to be responsible for the people. So. Uh, to follow up on the people who get saved so that these people have a church to land into and get discipled by these pastors. Um, so, yeah, it's not it's not like a just evangelism and like drop them, you know, kind of thing. It's it's there's a, there's efforts being put into uh, keeping the work going. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple ways. There's a couple ways you could uh, you could do it. Um, so one way, and I think this is maybe the most exciting way, is that real life church would be able to put together a team of people who would come and visit on one or maybe even more than that festivals, um, you know, during the year. And what that looks like is that you guys would, uh, you know, train you know, for a couple months beforehand on, on the kind of things that you would be doing, and you would be a street outreach team. So you would have 
basically the opportunity to go out and preach the gospel in, in the streets before the festival and like see salvations and cast out demons kind of thing. The second th on buses if they ever want to go someplace. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you well, not, bo yeah. Basically that idea is that you have a sound system and you're broadcasting your voice to a very large amount of people and uh, calling people to salvation. Who would be interested in something like that? Anybody be interested in something like that? Hey, so come on now. We could, we could form a team here. We could form a team. Absolutely. I think you need at least eight people to have a team. Okay. Um, so, you know, you could probably get 12 or 15. yeah, part, part of the being a team, the reason you need, uh, eight people is because you're doing things like a drama. You're, you're actually, um, doing a, a little drama that depicts the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus to these people so that they can see something with their eyes. They can see the power of the gospel with their eyes. So th th I think you need eight people for that drama, and then people to give their testimony, and there's dances to learn, that kind of thing. When does the next festival season start? The next fe festival season starts, I think, spring of 2022. Okay, so spring. We got some time to start planning. But they they're going up until winter. Up until winter. Of of uh, 2022. So there's and eight. Exactly. So there's tons of time uh, to get involved, and uh, you'll need some time so that you can uh, raise the money and to go. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you. We, we love you. And, um, <laughs> hey, so I just wanted to share real quick. So we, ha like I was saying, we have opportunities here. Luna um, takes a group out every s Saturday, right, or one, one month or one Saturday a month to go evangelize here. They go out, we have teams that go out every day. Our interns go out for f like four hours a day, five days a week to spread the gospel, to share the gospel. Some of you should be a part of that. Some of you should get a hold of Luna and say like, hey, I can, I can go out on an afternoon and, and learn about how to share your faith effectively with people who are, who are stretching themselves to learn how to do it effectively, right? Um, another opportunity um, we've got coming up on, on Halloween. Come and help us. A week from today, we're, they're, they're passing out tons of flyers. We need help with this stuff. If you want to share your faith, we have we, we there, there, there are opportunities. But also, November 27th, our Mexico church, Vida Verdera, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we're putting on another big outreach. They're going to have doctors. They're going to have, we're going to be giving out dispenses. Real Life Church is buying like 50 bags of, of food to give out. Um, and, and that's just part of it. We're going to go out and hit the streets. We're going to go out and evangelize and feed people. And so November 27th, if you don't have a, a passport, apply for one. We're doing lots of work over there and over here, and there's a lot of opportunities for you to go and, and to, to give your testimony out loud, to, to, you know, to talk to people. Um, start brushing up on your Spanish. We're going to have interpreters there, but start brushing up on little words and stuff. You know? Start gearing up. You know, we're called to both sides of the border. And how many of you know that we've got a, a huge Hispanic community here? And like over there, you can't go over and expect to speak English and have everybody understand. It just won't happen, right? So you've got to learn a little bit. But lots of opportunities. So, hey, thanks for participating. We have a meeting right now. If you're interested in helping out with our outreach on the 30th, uh, Marie is going to be, um, you know, guiding us through on what we can expect, how, how we can help, the things that we're going to be needing to set up. There's a lot of work that's going to have to go into this. So if you can, stick around and, and take part of the meeting. God bless you. We love you. Have a fantastic, fantastic week. And keep us in prayer. I'm going.